Alors, un petit mot d'introduction. Euh, bonsoir tout le monde. Euh, merci d'être euh, là. Euh, parce que c'est pas si nombreux. Euh, donc, euh, euh, voilà, je suis absolument ravi de vous accueillir pour cette deuxième rencontre du graphisme de cette année scolaire. Donc, euh, après l'atelier Marge Design, euh, il y a un mois et demi, euh, aujourd'hui, on accueille Pascal Zorbi, euh, qui est donc euh, typographe, typographe euh, néo vivant mais qui aujourd'hui euh, travaille et vit en Espagne. Et nous sommes absolument ravis et très fiers de l'accueillir euh, pendant une semaine à l'ESAV, où il anime un atelier euh, de création typographique avec les étudiants de master. Euh, sur la typographie de l'outil script, euh, en collaboration avec euh, Brian Rochera, euh, Giatran et puis euh, aussi Roy Espanco, donc un, un atelier très complet. Euh, mais voilà, en fait, on, on est vraiment euh, très content qu'il ait accepté de venir nous rendre visite. On a profité de ce présence pour qu'au-delà de sa classe et de la relation qui là, avec les étudiants, il puisse présenter son travail de créateur de caractère à un public plus large, déjà à l'ensemble des étudiants de des salles et puis il y a tous les autres qui ne sont pas étudiants des salles et qui sont venus par intérêt, par curiosité. Euh, voilà, donc je vais laisser la parole à Pascal qui va euh, faire cette présentation de son travail. Merci. Merci Cédric. Merci, Ezzard. Um, I'm going to speak in English. Sorry, I cannot speak in French. Hopefully, it will be uh, clear for everyone. Uh, my talk today is going to be about different Arabic type systems. So when we are designing Arabic typefaces, it's very, it's, it's very uh, challenging when you are going to create a new type family and you need to think of the whole uh, system. So before I start with that, I would just uh, say before that um, I'm the founder founder and the designer, uh, lead designer at 29 Letters. And it's a uh, multi-script uh, type foundry. So we are experts in Arabic and Latin. But also recently we started being, <coughs> uh, uh, starting to expand some of our type families to other world scripts, like Cyrillic and Greek and uh, Devanagari. The idea that the world is now this global village and uh, we need all of these different scripts to communicate together. And uh, a bit about me first, before I go back to typography. So as Cédric said, I'm from Lebanon. And um, this is the flag of Lebanon with different colors, with the colors of Ezav, to make it more fun. <laughs> so you know that in Lebanon, we speak Arabic with French and English, but like here in, in, in Morocco, like you mix French uh, also and, and Arabic. And it explains a lot about our trilingual and bilingual uh, character as, an, as, a, na as a, a nation and uh, people. So usually we say, hi, uh, kifkon, sava, or hi, kifak, sava, which is hi is English, uh, kifkon is Arabic, and sava is uh, French. And um, when it comes to everything urban from from uh, traffic signs or from uh, road signs or from uh, car plates or even the money, uh, basically everything that is uh, uh, based uh, on a governmental uh, um, identity or, uh, or institution, it's basically bilingual or trilingual. Um, And you can see that there's different also styles of uh, of typefaces used in in the, in the same document. And here is an example of one of my documents that you see also it's 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 uh, in three languages, so Arabic, English, and French. And uh, this is a report card also from a school that's also English and Arabic. But if you look close, there's my name here on it. So actually, it is my own report card when I was six years old. And the story goes that um, I had very big problems with languages when I was a kid. And if you look closely about the grades, there's so many red in them. <laughs> and all of the uh, Arabic, English, and French, I was failing. And at this stage, I was six years old, and the people at the school said, okay, your kid is not um, 
he he better go to another school that has only maybe two languages or one languages, or he needs to repeat uh, the class with some extra lessons. So what happened is that my parents went uh, to other schools in the in our uh, region, but no any uh, uh, non other school took me because my grades were very low. So my parents went back like with tears and crying my poor mom and uh, she was saying like okay please uh, no other school accepted our kid we need to keep him in in this school so uh, at, at the end they accepted but they said that I have to make classes and uh, leçon particulier and extra classes and exams every year for languages but the story goes that I really had difficult times from 12 to 6 uh, with the languages because they have important and maybe I had a bit of a mild dyslexia, which I didn't know about maybe back then in the 80s. And maybe I needed help in speech therapy. But back in the 80s, they only said that, no, he's just uh, not good enough or he's lazy or whatever. But later when it was uh, when I started becoming in the secondary years, so the important subjects became changing from languages to math and sciences. And then I started to, to, uh, to do better. And the same school that wanted to uh, kick me off when I was six, at the age of 17, they recommended that I have to do either engineering or, or an architect. Because back then I was good in science and, and, uh, and uh, physics and geometry, all of this stuff. But actually I decided to go into the, to the design career and I did graphic design and uh, typography and I was happy to be in the, in the university level, and I was so happy working with uh, type, but not with language, but as a letter. And actually, now when I speak about it uh, recently with my friends and my parents, and we analyze, like, how come you that suffered so much with languages and with letters, now you are a type designer? And maybe the, the, the answer to that is that my, I, my, my brain, uh, because it suffered a lot, throughout my my uh, my childhood maybe it it had this interest in these letter forms and in these shapes and the letters that made me now as a type designer so what was a handicap or a negative point changed to a creative aspect in my work so that's a a brief story from my past in a bit a different way um back to the design space so when we speak about a design space, we are speaking about either 3D, 2D, or a, or a vertical space. So a certain uh, typeface, so this is a, a typeface with three axes. This is two axes, and this is one. And the, the more axes it has, the more space it has, and the more complex it becomes, a certain type family. Uh, and in order to understand a bit more about the different families that can be created by the Arabic, we need to also know all the different styles of the Arabic uh, uh, style. So I'm going to show you the same uh, word uh, written by Hassan Masoudi from his book, uh, Calligraphy Arab Vivo. Uh, and it's the first sentence from the uh, Declaration of, uh, of the Human Rights from the UN. And you're going to see that how it really changes between style and style. So this is the old Kufi. This is the Maghribi Kufi. This is the ornamental Kufi. The modern Kufi. The Nasakh. So we move from the Kufi to the cursive ones. All the Kufics were during the Islamic Caliphates. And all the Nasakh, uh, they were uh, during the Ottoman uh, time. So Nasakh. Nasakh Masari, which is the modern Nasakh, Thulus, Diwani, Farsi, Ruka, and so many others. So this is only a very hint of the different styles in the Arabic, and it shows how, how rich and how flexible is the, is, the, is the calligraphy. And when it comes to the decision that a type designer wants to do a new typeface, we have to decide on which style we want to base our, our typeface or which one or two styles we want to base our typeface. So in the past around 16 years of my work, I have, I've, I've been focusing more on the Kufic, uh, Kufic styles and a bit on the cursive styles, which are more like the Nasakh and the bit the Thulus, more the Nasakh or the neo Nasakh, but mostly on the Kufic. And why is that? Because the Kufic basically is somehow easier 
to get to draw and to understand because it's a bit more geometric or it's a bit more modular. Whereas the cursive forms, they become a bit more uh, calligraphic, more uh, more written by hand. They need more complex uh, work and technical uh, detailing. And recently, last year, I started, uh, I took the, the challenge to work also on the Ruka style, which is uh, adds its own complexity. We're going to see later. So uh, super families are families that have uh, different styles in one in one typeface or one or one type family. So we're going to start with the first one. So this is Bukra. Bukra is a is a type family that explores the the design space of condensed to white and from thin to black. And uh, this typeface, when it started, and it was uh, it it is based on the Gothic style. It's very, it's very simple. It's very geometric. You can see that it has a minimum amount of uh, vertical uh, guidelines, and it is linked with a sans serif uh, Latin. This is the space of this uh, type family. It has a weight and width axis, so it changes by weight and by width. So from condensed to wide, and from thin to black. And also it has a, a, a slanted. The main idea started when I was looking at old archaic Kufic. Uh, and it's this very blobby, blocky kind of Kufi. And the brief was that uh, we want to create a, a, a typeface for, for uh, Ibn Battuta Mall in Dubai. This was back in, uh, in 2008. And they wanted this very big, chunky typeface that speaks all of these slogans and all of these messages in the mall and in the, in the space. It's a very big space in Dubai. So uh, based on the brief, I made only this weight in 208, which is only the black weight. And then after uh, five years in 2012, uh, I developed uh, the family into five weights. So it became from light to, 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 to bold. And then also we did the, the Latin for it. And then after five years from that in 2017, we did all the super family. And then it became a variable font. And it became one of the biggest uh, Arabic uh, typeface in the, in, the, in the market. So it has 94 styles, upright and italic. And also it exists in variable font. The variable font is a new technology that puts all of these styles in one file. And in this one file, I can move the axes and I can access all of these different uh, uh, styles that exist in this uh, design space. So here you see the wow and the O, and here you see the ones coming from, from condensed to, to white and from bold to, to thin, and also there's the, the, the slanted. Another uh, super family is Zared. And this uh, typeface, instead of uh, working on the idea of the wits, we said let's work on the idea of different styles and different uh, um, techniques used to create a certain typeface that's more for 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 publication, not for titling, not for headlines, but more for body text, for small text for reading. And it's it's a bit more advanced and complex than than Bookrat. You see, there's more uh, vertical lines to it. It's more detailed, and uh, but also the Latin, it's a, it's a sans for it. Here you see that there's only one axis for this super family, but there's different kind of styles in it. So there's a slab, text, serif, sans, st uh, stencil, and display. So all of these different type families, they are based on the same skeleton, on the same idea, but they all have different kind of, uh, of skin or of, uh, so they have the same skeleton, but they have different voice, different skin to them. And they all can be used together or each one by itself can, can be used alone. So, uh, and these axes, they also have italics. And we went even further with the, with, with the scripts, as we said before. So we are developing now also not only the Arabic and the Latin, but also with the Greek, Cyrillic, and the Venagari and other letters. So how to also translate the same idea through different scripts. So this was also the other challenge. So not only styles, but also different scripts. And the idea started uh, for this, it was uh, for a newspaper in uh, Dubai for Emirates today. They asked me to do a headline typeface for the newspaper. 
And I did some research about uh, old uh, uh, old newspapers in the Arab world. This is an example for uh, Al-Nahar from Beirut. And you can see that in the old times, they used the, the headlines they used to be written in Nasakh or Ruka, but by, by a uh, calligrapher. And then in the 90s, they became a typeface. They became more Nasakh Mastery. So you notice here it's more Nasakh written, and here it's more has a very straight baseline. And when it came to design, um, this is Al Ahram from Masr, from Egypt. And the idea was that I want to make this headline I face with a very thick baseline, very robust letters, very strong cuts, to give the seriousness and this strong voice to the to the newspaper. So this was the first way that was done also the board in 2012. And then after after years on years, when the when the when the family started growing. In 2007, we developed the, the set of styles, which are more for the headlines. And then in 2018, we did the text and the sounds. So the text is more for the small body text. And the sounds is more the, the neo nasr version of it. And then in 2019, we did the display and the slab, which were more for, again, for the display usage and for headlines. And at the end, we did the stencil for urban usage usage and uh, and style. but. If you look at all of them, they are they are different, but they share the same character to them, and this is what makes this this the super family very very strong and very useful for designers and for publishers to use it in in their own projects for different uh, use uh, applications or hierarchy and in uh, typography. And you see here, just to compare, in this same type family here, it's only the starting point of the lamb, and you see that the lamb how it have different kind of starting pen stroke or different heads compared to the display, the text, the serif, and the sounds, and the stencil, and the slab. And here you see the letter wow and all of the different uh, styles in the super family and how it somehow changes completely, but in other places it, it retains the same structure. And this is the A and the Kav and the both scripts, Arabic and the Latin. So that's Zared. The other uh, different uh, super family is called Ocaso and Oscura. And Ocaso and Oscura, when I moved to Spain, I was searching for some Arabic heritage that I can research and make a typeface out of. Maybe it was also a need for me to feel linked to the, to, to the new nation that I, I am living now in. And I found out that there's a manuscript that, that are called Al Khamiado. In uh, Arabic, it's called Al Ajamiya. And these were manuscripts that, that were written by, by Arabs that stayed in Spain after, the, after the, the Spanish monarchy came back. But they were writing Spanish and Arabic. So I can show you later an example. But you can see that Ocaso, it's, it is in between the word of geometry and the word of, of, cursiveness, of cursiveness. And it has its complexity but also it's very, it's, very, it's very simple and straightforward. And also it's a type system with two axes, the weight and the, and the stretch axis. So instead of having weight and width, it has a stretch. And I'm going to speak why it has a stretch axis. So some letters, they can stretch. And also uh, Oscura has only one axis. So in this case, and also an italic, uh, so this, this, this is an example of a page of these manuscripts. So if you look at it, for the people who, who can read Arabic, if you look at it and you start reading, you will see that it's not Arabic. If you start reading, it will come up at, as old Spanish, as archaic Spanish. If you take this word that is in red and you try to read it, it, it says lash lagrimash. And las lagrimash means las lagrimas in Spanish. So if you take this and you take it phonetically, lash la grimas, and then you flip, you flip the letters from right to left to left to right, then becomes las lagrimas. So this is an example of of this manuscripts, and from these manuscripts, you notice that there's a lot of different styles. They are based on the Andalusian Kufic, which is a bit inspired from the Maghrebi Kufic. But it's very rough, it's very vernacular, and it's very pure, it's very, it's very simple. And you notice that some of them, they're very geometric, where the others are very cursive and very curvy. 
So I decided to make two different typefaces and place them in the same superfamily. So there's Ocaso, which is more based on geometry, and Oscura, which is it's more rounded and more cursive. So that's Ocaso. So this is the manuscript, and this is the typeface. You can see that you can feel the inspiration from it, but the typeface is super geometric, very clean. It's the purest version of this manuscript and done in this contemporary type design approach. And this is Oscura, which also shares somehow the same skeleton, but it's more cursive, it's more round. And when you see them together, they really work together, but also they're so different. And also there's a slanted to them. So the first one is the geometric one, the lower one is the cursive one, and then the last one is the slanted one. Some letters, they really only change form or curve, while some, some other letters, they're really drawn from, from, from scratch. So maybe it's a fluid type family, or it's, it, it is a geometric type family, and it has a slanted. So this type family, with this weight and stretch uh, axis, the letters, they can grow in weight, and they can grow in, in width, but it's not condensed or wide, the same letter, it can stretch in a, in a, uh, in a horizontal way, based on the manuscripts that were uh, studied of the, of the Al-Khamiyadu. And this shows a, a small preview about how this variable font works. So here we have the, the thin K and the black K and also the stretch and the normal K. And that's the Ayn, also thin, bold and stretch. So that was Ocaso. And the, the, the latest type system that we're working uh, on uh, this year and it's going to be published next year. And uh, I can easily say that this is the most complex uh, Arabic type system that I worked on in the past like 16, 17 years of my type design work. Uh, it's going to be called Ada, which comes from the Arabic words Ada, am Ada. So from the word to give light or to give performance. And it's a Ruka typeface with different weights and also different different styles. And what you directly see with the Ruka is that the baseline is not anymore straight on the horizontal, but it is it, it it goes up, it's slanted, it goes, it's called hanging baseline or an escalating baseline. And when you have this problem, uh, this is not a problem, when you have this aspect and the and the typeface, it becomes a problem technically to make it work in a way that the typeface will link correctly with this land and then to space it properly in, in, in Arabic. And notice that you see here that the guidelines are only based on the lower end, whereas the upper end is not important. So only the base and the descenders are important, whereas the ascenders are not important anymore because it is ascending. Uh, this is the Latin version of it. It is in two axes, it has weight and contrast this time. Not uh, width, not stretch, but contrast. And you, and, and, and you can notice that every time with every type family, we have to come up with a different kind of a idea to create this type system and make it interesting for the, for the, for the community, for the Arab design community and the multilingual community. So it grows from, uh, so, so it is high contrast to low contrast and from thin to black. And also it has a round version. The research of this project, it didn't start from any topic by itself compared to the other projects. It was typically studying the Ruka style itself. So the Ruka style itself became the study point because it's, it is this complex, complex style. So we were studying, I had some consultancy from uh, uh, from Arabic calligrapher called Wissam Shaukat. He's a renowned artist and, 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 and calligrapher. He helped me understand the, the logic of the Ruka style. Uh, I had me, even after 15 years of doing Arabic type design, I had to learn to understand how would a Ruka typeface behave differently than a Nasakh one or a Kufi one. And after uh, Wissam explained to me all the uh, logic of it, and also he made, uh, he showed me all references of all old masters, old calligraphy um, masters. I started drawing the typeface and started developing it. 
I'm not going to show all the process. We're going directly to jump to the end result. But you can see that here, what happened in this type system that we have, we're going to have a sharp version, a flat version, and a round version. So this type system of this type family, it goes from the most calligraphic to the most uh, urban or the most uh, casual. So this is the closest version for, for the calligraphic form. This is the in-between, like the modern version of this calligraphic form. And this is the most casual form that you would be like if you write it by pen on paper. So here you see the, the Latin, so we have the sharp, flat, and round. And here you see the wow and the sharp, flat, and round. So again, they share the same skeleton form, but they are so different. And they have different voices. So that's, uh, that's Ada. And also the other challenge that we took is that we said we, we want to make it from thin to black. Usually most of the available Ruka typefaces to date, they only have maybe one or two weights maximum. Maybe they have some others, but most of the common ones, they come basically in the regular and bold or bold and black or basically in the more heavier weight. Very few of them have this spectrum of weights and have the, 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 the light and the bold. And you can see that the counters and the, and the light weight, they open up to allow for for legibility and and easy uh, readability. So when this typeface is going to be published by the beginning of next year, also it's going to be uh, one of the biggest uh, Ruka Arabic type systems in the, in the Arabic community. And going a bit further with technology, uh, before technology, let's, let's now share. So I showed you four different type systems. And each of these type systems me as a Arabic type uh, type designer, I had to create the vertical guidelines for it. Unlike for the Latin, where it's uh, the same for all of the different styles. So let's first compare the Arabic. So in most of the Kufic and the Nasr fonts that I worked on, they have this kind of system. Well, as the Ruka, it has this kind of system. If you look closely to it, you will notice that and the, and the Nasr and Kufic typefaces, there's only one baseline and one thickness for the baseline. Whereas in the Arabic, the baseline and the thickness of the baseline, they are floating. They can be anywhere in this area. But what is important is that there's, instead of only one base, we have four bases, depending on where each letter should start on. And then we have two descenters, or we call them earth, Arad, in Arabic. Uh, above, it's not any more important because it is escalating. But then if we compare the Arabic to the Latin, the Latin is always constant in all of the typefaces. There's only one baseline, one X height, cap height, ascender and descender. But in the Arabic, it's not the case. And this is, again, shows the flexibility of the Arabic, but also it shows the complexity of it that every type designer, whenever he or she are deciding to create a new Arabic typeface, they have to come up with their own typographical, uh, typographical guidelines. Another more uh, uh, complex uh, font engineering or uh, technical aspect of the Arabic typography. Uh, of course, for every typeface, you have to decide also what kind of technical aspects you want to use for it. And also there's different uh, techniques. If we're doing Kufi or Nasakh or Ruka, you need to apply different kinds of techniques to it. So I want to speak about the Ruka now because it's the latest project and also it's the most complex. Just to make you take a bit inside the world of the technical part that no one actually sees. It's only like in the, in the backstage. But actually it's a lot of work and a lot of, uh, lot of uh, solutions need to be done uh, in, a, in a coding way. So here we see, so in Arabic we have 28 letters. But if we uh, uh, count the, all the initial medial, uh, final, and isolated forms of every letter, the basic form, which we see here, these two slides are only the basic forms. They become around 129 or 130 letters, glyphs, forms, to make the, the letters. But then it doesn't stop here. Then we have to create all the different combinations or all the different ligatures that come in the Arabic. 
So here we can see the the alif and the wow, which have only isolated and final forms. While, for example, the ta and the fa, they have four different forms. And some of them, they are somehow similar, but some of them, they're really crazy, like the ha. Like, n there's not any similarity in any form of these forms. And this is actually the hardest letter to draw in Arabic, if, you, if you're drawing Arabic. And then comes the ligatures. So the most common ligature is the la, which is the la. The laf, the lam, and the alif becomes la. But then also we have so many others. We have the lam ha, the kaf meme, the sad ha, the, the uh, stuff with the ra, with the noon, with the scene, with the sad. And then if you have to create all of these ligatures, the base form becomes very minimal and the ligatures, they become hundreds. So if you want to actually make this font be as cursive as you can, at the end, it might be above 1,000 or 1,500 number of glyphs that you have to create to make it work as close as possible to the calligraphy. But thankful to open type features on open type coding, this is what we use to, to code fonts. We can create basic forms. And from these basic forms, we write a code that creates all of these combinations without having to input all of these characters in the typeface. I'm going to try to explain as much as possible. And this is just to say that also beside the basic forms and the, and the ligatures also have the accents. So we have the soft vowels and the hard vowels. The soft vowels are the tashkil in Arabic and the hard vowels are the alif, the vowel and the ya. So back to the typeface. So in Ruka, we have the base forms, which are these forms. We have some ligatures that might happen, that will surely happen, not might happen. We have the dots, and then we have the accents. And you have to make the typeface understand all of these different combinations and to put them correctly in the correct place when you are typing a certain typeface. And for this to work, in a, in, a, in a right way, you have to do a lot of uh, coding and positioning and uh, scripting. So the idea is I'm not going to go very deep into it. I'm just going to give you like some, some uh, hints into it. So we create the, the different weights and different masters. And then we have to uh, tell the software to to understand all of these different shapes and to understand what would he put in a certain position depending on whether that comes before or after the shape and depending if there's a dot or not and depending if there's an accent or not. And all of this coding will be done inside of, and now, now you're seeing this coding inside of glyphs, which we use as a, as a typeface. And for the coding of Ruka, because it's, it's a complex coding, I, I had to collaborate with uh, the type designer and, and font enge engineer called Toshi Omagari. He's a, uh, he's a Japanese uh, type designer living in London. And he's a type designer and a font engineer. And he, and he uh, wrote the, the code to, to, to make this font work. So when I was working along with it, the character set of this typeface was around 1,500, something like this. It was a big amount of, of, of glyphs that I had to create. But then what Toshi did is he, he decomposed all of, these, uh, all of these different combinations. And he took, okay, so let's, instead of making all of these different ligatures, we're going to make four different shapes for the sad, for example. And from these four different shapes of the sad, Depending on, on what comes before or after, we're going to introduce a certain shape. So this is this is the same letter. This is sad, 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 sad. But here you see that in the word masir, it has a different shape than in the word fayahsal or muasir or afsah or nas. Why? Because it depends what is happening before or after it. And this is one example, and you have to apply this to all the letters that exist in the Arabic, in the, in the Arabic script.
The other point that was really new in glyphs and in order to make it easy is that is these anchor positions. So me, I draw one base forms, like this is an example of the hat. If and if I put the right anchors from only this 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 drawn letter and the anchors, I create all of these different forms. So here we have the jim on top, the ha and the ha on the bottom. And with different forms of these accents combinations. But me, I don't have to do them. I only do one of them. But I have to assign it well. And then all of these are done automatically when someone is typing on the computer. This is another example of the Aleph. And now recently in Glyphs, they added something called conditional anchors. So we have the normal anchors and we have conditional anchors. And the conditional anchors, it says that depending what happens, what comes before or after the Aleph with Hamza below, for example, the positioning of the Aleph of the Hamza will shift. Because if it's always in the same position, it might touch here or here or here, it might overlap. So also we need to have this flexible positioning of these accents to make them move depending also what comes before and after them. Like here, alone, and with the calf, it moves to the left. So you see here how it's moving. And etc. Another point is the contextual alternates, which, which I showed before on the side. And you create a certain understanding for the for the for the for for all the shapes that come in the initial form in the medial form and the final form and then you you can create all of these ligatures automatically with the code without having to put them in the typeface so for example here you can see we have the the letter ba on the first line we have the other sad, which we saw before, and the calf. And you can see that the ba in the middle and the, and the initial that comes before two teeth, or in the middle, or in the beginning before a scene, or at the end. Anyways, you get the idea. So again, they are all different, but they are the same letter. The same for the calf. If it comes with the with the uh, and alif, it becomes curved. If it becomes after the ra, it, it shifts down. If it becomes uh, be before the meme, it, it stands above it, etc. And for this to happen, uh, Toshi had to write an extensive list of contextual alternate encoding to make this happen and work. And the last part is the kerning and the spacing. So before, if you're working only in a Kufic or in a type face that has a very straight baseline and a horizontal spacing, it's very simple to space because you only space in an equal way. So always, the, for example, if the dal uh, comes before the ayn, it will have always the same positioning and I, I can space it and curl it. But with the, with the ruqa, if the dal is followed by, by a ghain, this space can change depending what is following it. So if there's one letter, it becomes here. If there's four letters, it becomes up here. And for example, here another example. So what happens is that the, the, the more that the letter is longer, the more it goes higher, and the more space will be, will be happening below it. And if there's not correct kerning, this word can, look, can become two words, and it will need to be spaced. And Toshi created a very smart solution, what he called elevation kerning, which is really a new technology. And you can see that from this, we can do this. From this, it comes to this. And from this to that. So here, it looks very well spaced and becomes one word. While here, it can wrongly be read as two words. And to do that, Toshi made a very smart way to uh, calculate the elevation of every letter when it is elevating. So I'll try to explain as much as possible. So you see here the numbers. The higher this number is, the more kerning needs to be deducted. The more negative space need, needs to be added. So you can see that, for example, al maja. so this is a word in, the, in, in Ada, and, th and this is a word in Okasu. 
And you can see in our castor, so all of it is straight on the baseline, where in ADA, you see how much it went up 26 levels up. And in this case, there's no problem because there's the Aleph, but if there's a Ra here, there'll be a big space. Like here you see a Ra and a Wow. So here in, in Okaso, there's no problem because the Zain and the Mim, they will always have the spacing in any kind of combination. Whereas in, in Ruka, depends what happens after, this Mim can be at this level or this level or this level, depending on what happens after it. So that's how he made a certain solution to put anchors to calculate the elevation of every letter when you are typing. And based on this elevation, it will apply a certain number of kerning to make it go inside. So this is what we call elevation kerning, which is, uh, this is like not more than two years old, this kind of technology. And we're trying to use it in our funds. And this is another example. This is the longest word in Arabic. And you can see the difference between the, the normal font and the Ruka font. Again, this is another example. And basically, that's a small hint about this type technology. And the idea is that always the typographer and the technology, are they always working together? Or they're always like, the typographer wants to, do, wants to create a certain typeface, but the technology is not available to make him create this typeface. So why I'm doing a Roka typeface now, not 16 years ago, because now the technology is easy and available enough to make me decide, okay, let's take the challenge of, of making a Roka typeface. But if I did this project 15 years ago, it would be a much more different complex kind of uh, work process. And it would have took me much more time. And maybe it would have only been able to do only one weight or one style. So the idea is that the, the typefaces, the type designer and the technology, they're always going hand in hand. And the more the technology advances, the more the fonts become more calligraphic, more cursive, more advanced and more complex. And that's why you see that if you go back 10 years ago and you look at the Arabic fonts present in 10 years ago and 20 years ago, the further you go, the more simplified they are. We call it simplified Arabic fonts because the, the, the technology back then wasn't very supportive of the Arabic script. But the more you come closer to nowadays and the future to come, the Arabic fonts are going to be more and more uh, advanced and cursive and complex and, and this. So this is the main idea about the parallelism between technology and type design. So does technology respond to the needs of the typographer or does the designer limits his or her creative developments to the, to the technology? So this is, this is the question. And uh, me, to finish, I have to say that even after 16 years of working as type designer, I still feel that I'm still starting to learn. I still feel that I'm still learning this script and this Arabic, Arabic type. And now what I'm learning in Ruka, I never knew the complexity of this style before doing it this year. I didn't know this 15 years ago. And this is what is interesting about the Arabic type design career and about the type design career in general, that you keep on, you have to keep on moving with the technology and with the, with the learning. So that's it. Thank you. And hopefully, if you guys are very